I want to hear your voice, hear your voice. Nothing else really matters but your choice. I want to live unhindered. My life surrendered. I want to hear. I want to hear your voice. I want to hear your voice. Nothing else really matters but your choice. I want to live unhindered. My life surrendered. I want to hear. I want to hear voice anything you want anything you ask whatever you desire largest name the task oh that's what I will do oh that's what I will do precious Holy Spirit I'm in love with you precious Holy Spirit I'm in love with you teach me how to please you show me how to pleasure you today. Let me live in your presence that comes every time I obey. You made me for a reason You made me to love, you made me to care, you made me for a reason, you made me for a reason, you made me to bring somebody joy. You made me for a reason. That's what you made me for. You made me for a reason. You made me to bring joy. Father, I thank you today for your presence, your goodness. You stirred us today in the prayer world at 12 o'clock to pray for single women who had been widowed, divorced, or never married. And I felt such a stirring and an anointing to pray. You gave me the number 20, 20 ladies of the gospel, 20 women who loved your presence. 20 women who love the house of God. But their assignment had not been realized, identified. Lord, I've written books about Abigail, Esther, Ruth, Rebecca, the five women of the Bible who were easy to love. And I thank you today. 
on this afternoon as I teach on this subject of identifying the God-appointed man who would give you security, significance, a kind environment, a man who was willing to listen, learn, pursue, reach. I don't know who those 20 women are today, but I'm here for them. I ask you for Nadine today. As she is a widow, Dr. Diana, I ask you for every person to hear your voice. To hear your voice in Jesus' name. Welcome to the prayer world. The prayer world is a place of hope. It's a place of God's presence. The prayer world is a place of learning, a place of wisdom. It's a place where you discuss every struggle with the God who created you, with an intercessor who's me. And I thank God for you. So thankful for you being here. If you want to take notes, feel free to. It may not be very long. What happened today at 12 o'clock was so extraordinary. Two hours of pouring out pictures that God would give me. I welcome the countries of Brazil, Canada, UK. I welcome Clovia, Julie, Lynn in England, Sarah Kate from Durban, South Africa, Pastor Arturo, Nadine, Cindy Jones, one of my most loyal partners, Barbara, all the way in Brazil. I welcome the UK, Brazil. I'm teaching from a book in a few moments, The Difference in Men. This is how to talk to a man. It's dating talk. Why did God create a woman? Was the garden not fascinating enough? Was the elephant, the dinosaur, the monkey, the skunk, the dogs, cows, sheep? Was that not enough? Was God himself not enough for Adam? Could that be true? The Bible says that Adam and God walked and talked every afternoon. Adam told God every feeling he had. After some time, God observed Adam and God said, he needs someone else besides me. Is it true that God is not enough? Of course it's true God is not enough. He would have never made Eve if God's presence was enough. The brilliance of God is easily discernible. God saw that Adam had a need that he himself could not feel. Was it sex? Possibly. Was it having children? Possibly. Was it having admiration? Possibly. We only know that Adam had a need. God himself recognized he could not meet. God did not take, as one writer said, he did not take the woman from the head of man to head man. He did not take woman from the feet of man to be stomped on or walked over by man he took from the rib. Hold me, hold one moment. Pastor Anna, are you there? Welcome here. Thank so good to see you, sir. Thank you for joining me.
my goal in this talk to you today is to awaken in you a desire of the man in your life. I'm not talking to men today. I am talking to women of the gospel, women who love God's presence. You perhaps may be single, never married before in your life. You may be 20, you may be 60. You may be widowed and your husband died. Your husband may have left you for another woman. I'm only talking to the single woman these moments today. But a woman who wants God's plan, God's will, God's way. If you tell me I'm completely satisfied in being single, there is no reason for you to listen any further. I would go to the TV room and watch television. If you tell me I don't trust any man, I don't want every man in my life. I want to be single the rest of my life. If you tell me I'm widowed and I was satisfied and I could never meet a man comparable to my husband, I'll accept your assessment of your world and you're free to go to the other room and watch television. But if in your heart you go to bed at night wishing you had a man to hold you, love you, talk to you. If you wish you could wake up every morning into the eyes of a man that says, you're the sweetheart of my life. You're my world. If you long to hear a man reassure you of your difference and comment what he likes about you. If you long to walk through your home and putting it in order while your man is at work, earning a living to provide you security, then this could be the talk for you. I am not here to complain about Eve creating the proximity and bringing Adam into the presence of the snake in the garden. Eve was not an evil person. Evil had not even been introduced. But Eve wanted good things for Adam. She wanted Adam to enjoy his world. My mother said one time and several times to me, that a woman's greatest gift was adaptability to a man. That a man did not have that gift. But that a woman had the gift to adapt to the needs of a husband. My mother also emphasized to me that her joy was in the happiness of her man that a woman was extremely satisfied when she saw her man happy. That was her opinion. By far the wisest woman I had ever known in my life. The godliest woman I've ever been around. I'm going to take you back to my home that I was raised in. My mother was 12 when her father died, a Methodist steward in the church. She had seven brothers and one sister. Her two, bro two of her brothers, Buddy and AJ, were enjoyable. At 13, she met my father. I'm providing context so you can understand my teaching. My father decided when he was 16 years old to go to a school dance. And so his friend and him walked into the back door of the little schoolhouse 
in Livelyville, Texas. Outside of Grapeland, Palestine, Palestine, Crockett, Texas. And my mother was sitting on the front seat, 13, and she turned around and looked into the eyes of my father, who had just walked through the door. There was instant infatuation from my father. And he turned, after seeing my mother, turned to his friend and says, do you see that girl on the front seat? I will marry her. It was the first time he had ever seen her. Mm. His friend says, that's my sister. Mm -hmm. That night he wanted to walk home with my mother. My mother had seven brothers. She refused to walk on the same side of the street with him. She knew he would try to hold her hand. She would not give him that privilege because she did not know him. And they talked four or five miles walking back to her house. And he walked her all the way home several miles and they talked across the street. Mm. And my father was smitten and he wanted her in his life. She married him when she was 14 and he was 17. He went to his father and says, Daddy, Willie and I are getting married. A very quiet man, his grandfather looked at him and said, Son, where will you live? Because my father didn't even have a job. And my grandfather said, where will you live? And he says, here with you, Daddy. <laughs> Papa was his reference. We're living here with you, Papa. In that house was seven women who were my father's seven sisters. His one brother, Earl. And so there was seven plus one plus two plus two plus another one. Hmm. My father, my mother, did not enjoy that arrangement. Illustration. In China, there is an icon, an emblem, with two women under the same roof. Two women under the same roof. And I'm told it's the Chinese... Symbol for trouble. <laughs> Two women can hardly live together in the yes. same house. Women are creatures of conflict. It's in them. One day my mother told her aunt, I, I really don't want to live in the house with all these women. I want to move, but John won't. John wants to stay here. John was my father. And her aunt says, I want you to anoint a handkerchief. I want you to anoint it with oil. And I want you to put it under his pillow. Tell the Lord to move on him to leave his house. A scripture reference is well known. A man is to leave his mother and father and cleave to his wife. A man who wants to stay at home with his mother and father is not yet a man. He is a child and must be treated and viewed as a child. No true man wants his mother and father in the house with him when he's mature. He wants a woman in his house, 
a princess. He wants a queen. How do you know if you have a man who's a king when you feel like a queen? How do you know if your man is a king if he provides you a palace? The best environment you could have. That's how you know we have a king. It's possible you could marry a child who's 20 and 25 and 30. I've had people work at the ministry who were 33, 34, and 35, 35, and they were complete children, six and seven years old mentally in their mind. I believe it was 24 hours. My dad didn't know the prayer handkerchief was under his pillow. Is it true prayer handkerchiefs work? They did in the New Testament. Yes. They do when you believe. The New Testament calls it the aprons. the apostle and my dad got up the next day or there shortly and says uh, I want to move out of here and get our own house the power of a prayer handkerchief is very mm. powerful wow very very powerful I'm going to send 20 ladies 20 handkerchiefs out of my closet. I want you to stay close. I will anoint those prayer handkerchiefs and I will send them to you. Wherever you are in the world, there's 20 because mm -hmm. that's how strong the anointing is today for your mate. My mother was outspoken. A real man, a true man, a pure man, a holy man longs to hear the opinion of his wife. He will not make a major decision without her reactions. A man of God treasures a true woman of Will he notice other women? Undoubtedly. Often. Will he comment on other women? Not if he's wise. But he probably isn't wise yet. Samson had a woman problem. But the anointing was all over him. But he had a woman problem. He was advised by his father to stay away from women who weren't under the umbrella of God. But he had sex on his mind. Most men do. Most of their lifetime. David looked out his window and saw a woman named Bathsheba taking a shower publicly where he could see her. Was she a holy woman? Evidently not. Did she want to be seen? What woman doesn't? She wanted to be seen. She intended to be seen. She planned to be seen. That's why she took her clothes off. God made a woman for a man. God made woman for a man. Yes. One man, that's all just one man, no. Because if that man married someone else, she could never be in the will of God the rest of her life. And you'll never make me believe that 6,000 years of women 
and men that every person obeyed the identical person they were supposed to marry. No, there's more than one that's workable. There's more than one man that's possible. You won't meet them all the same day. But there's more than one man you can be extremely happy with. There's more than one woman a man can be extremely happy with. There's not just one person set aside just for you out of 7.7 billion people and you've got to search the earth. What if God put him in China? What if God put him in Ukraine? Well, he's probably dead by now if he was placed in Ukraine. Mr. World Assassin, Putin, probably has killed him by now. What if you got to chose somebody and they got in out of the will of God and they married another? What if that man married another woman? Then you're stuck. Oh, now I've got to be single the rest of my life. The man God had chosen for me made a mistake. No, no. Do you want a man? What kind of man? You will have to adapt to his sexual desires, his fantasies, his wishes. You'll have to love what he loves. You'll need to enjoy what he enjoys. You'll need to want his presence. And he'll need to desire your presence. And he'll need to identify what makes you excited about life. Likewise, a man that God has for you is incredibly pleasured. When you're happy. Example. There's a restaurant here. 14 minutes away. And I said, baby, where would you like to eat? She named the restaurant. She loves pork chops. I don't eat pork. I don't want bacon. I like it, but I don't want it because of the pig experience of the prodigal son. <laughs> I don't eat pig. I will not eat pig. That started some years ago. But she loves pork. And she loves this restaurant. We've been there about three times. And she says, let's call and make arrangements. Time, about 15 to 5, 5 o'clock. The restaurant says we have no available table. Until 8 o'clock, do you think I'm going to let my baby, the sweetheart of my life, you think I'm going to let my baby wait till 8 o'clock to eat at our favorite restaurant? Mm -hmm. I'm six, six, 75, I'll be 76 April. Three things I learned. People lie, people are stupid, and people don't know what they're talking about. Those are the three <laughs> things I've learned in 76 years. People lie, they're stupid, and they don't know what they're talking about. There's 17 other qualities I'll give you later. One of them is nobody wants you to have what you want. That's why you get married. Out of the whole earth, there's a man who lives to give you what you love. His only joy is your excitement. Brother Mike, what did you do? Find another restaurant? No. She likes this restaurant. Do I? It's okay. It's okay. But her joy matters 76 times more than mine. Hmm. 
I said, we're going ahead anyway to the restaurant. My experience is they're liars, ignoramuses, idiots. They cook good food, but they don't know anything about it. And we're going to walk straight in to the restaurant. And there will be tables there that nobody's sitting at. We're going to go ahead and go to that restaurant. I don't believe the person who answered the phone. Now, your whole life depends on who you believe. I don't believe them. <laughs> and so we went and sat down. Beautiful tables. I called, we called two or three, four people. You were one of them, yes. Pastor Anna, and said, would you like to come join your husband here? Let's see. And when the pork chops came, the joy on Christina's countenance, I had to look up because it was surpassing the joy of the return of Christ. Was Jesus returning? Was Jesus returning? Was Jesus returning? The pork chops were beautiful. My baby smiled at me and smiled and smiled and began to cut up her pork chops. Brother Mike, what did you eat? Doesn't matter what I ate. The whole goal of a man is to give you everything you could possibly want. That's the purpose of a man protection, provision, pleasure. That's the purpose of a man in your world. A man who will fight every man around you. If a man raised his hand against my wife, his nose would be shoved into his brain, take seven seconds, if a man tried to hurt my wife, he would be blinded by two fingers of the fastest hands my martial artist ever saw in his whole lifetime. Mm. No, you don't mess with my woman. She's my baby. She's my sweetheart. If you know the purpose of a man, you want one of them. <laughs> For the rest of your days. How do you talk to a man? Carefully. You talk to a man observing his eyes. Does he look at you when you talk? Or is he looking over your shoulder? Is he looking at another woman that might be prettier? more shapely. Is he so crude he looks at your breast while you're talking? If he's attentive, he'll notice your fingernails, your toenails. But he's looking at you to see who you are. Give him time to find out who you are. Mm. Make him a pursuer. Make him ask you questions about your life. Don't start spilling out information about yourself. A woman's made to be pursued, reached for. But if she's brilliant, she's available, accessible, within reach. Ask him questions about his, what he admires, loves. What kind of work do you do? Don't talk fast. 
men are very slow thinkers. I haven't met one who wasn't. Haven't met a man in my life who could think as fast as a woman. The reason he can't think real, real fast is because he's looking. <laughs> he's 80% looker, 20% thinker. Wow. Is Donald Trump that way? Uh-huh. Been with him for hours. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. He's a professional looker. Wisdom is the ability to recognize difference, difference in people. Proverbs 2, 5, 12, and 16. Difference in an environment. Difference in an opportunity. Difference in assignment. Difference in temperament. Difference in personality. The difference in men is who they admire. Admiration is the number one key to success. Admiration of someone that's great, an achiever, successful. Admiration reveals humility. Admiration looks up to somebody more skilled than yourself, better than yourself, greater than yourself. Admiration creates proximity, invitation. Who does that man admire? And how will you find out? Mm. Number two, the difference in men is what they're willing to change. We're marred, we're scarred. We're wounded. Some of us have temperament problems. I'm very gentle and kind and reaching out to people until I'm attacked. I'm the original bipolar human. I change in five seconds if I feel like someone is insulting me, dishonoring me. If I was a black man, I would be in jail because I would respond quickly to a white man scornful of my black color. The difference in men is what they're willing to change. There's five ways to improve your future. Change your focus. Change your routine. Change your goals. Change your vocabulary. Change who you honor. Your focus is your world. Three, the difference in men is their reactions to their mistakes. David had a problem, but he had a he had a good quality. He confessed quickly his sin. He was so quick to admit when he was wrong. Four, the difference in men is their reaction to authority. If you're on a date, speed limit 60. He's going 80. As soon as possible, cancel the evening together. The man has no regard for authority. The role of authority is order. The role of authority is to remove lawbreakers, the rebel, contentious. If your man has no regard for authority, you're going to have a lifetime of pain. Mm -hmm. Where do you learn authority? By the time you're six. You learn authority by the time you're six years old. And if your man's 30, it's too late. Yes. Five, the difference in men is their reaction to an instruction. An instruction is an opportunity for favor. If his boss gives him instruction, but he wants to change it, 
he will never walk in the river of favor. There will be drops of favor across his lifetime. But never will you live beside the river of favor with the man who sneers, scornful, sarcastic toward instruction. An instruction is an opportunity to build credibility. An instruction is an invitation to a promotion. Six, the difference in men is their reaction to correction. Correction is an attempt to stop a tragedy. Correction is a gift from someone compassionate towards your life. Yes. Correction is the escape door from a painful experience. Seven, the difference in men is their reaction to an opportunity, an invitation to an experience. The difference in men is their curiosity. You can only succeed where you're curious. Questions are the proof of curiosity. Questions are the only proof of curiosity. Questions are the only proof of a passion to know and learn. Well. If your man is not curious, he's a non-learner. Today's the best he will ever be. He will deteriorate. Four things I listen for in every conversation. I listen for the sound of pain. Pain's an invitation to show and reveal my character. I listen for the sound of honor. I listen for knowledge. I listen for curiosity. What are they wanting from me? Are they willing to listen for me? Three preachers wanted to buy the Wisdom Center. They sent word to my sister, Deborah. We want to buy the Wisdom Center. We put a school, a big school there. And we want to meet with Brother Mike. I knew them all three very well. None of them were worth a cup of coffee. None of them. All three of them. Jackasses with capital letters. Not one of the three were honest people. All three were preachers. They were working together. And I told my sister, Deborah, I said, tell them you're my spokesperson. and that I would like two paragraphs written out what they want to do with the Wisdom Center and what is their financial offer for the Wisdom Center. They laughed. I think that happened three times. What I'm raced to the Wisdom Center when he found I was there. I said, I won't be here. I value myself at a very high level. I know who I am. I know who I am worth. I know what I am in somebody's life. I know that in my relationship, I will never lie. I will never steal. I will never take from them. I know that I'm a pure experience. Better know your value. Better know your value. They refused the most simplest request I made. I was ready to knock off several million dollars if they wanted to use the Wisdom Center for a good purpose. I made a simple request right on a piece of paper. What you're offering, what you want to do, and let me look at the place. Let me look at your paper before I invest my time. My time 
is valuable. I find out quick who doesn't think my time and my teaching is valuable. I have no future with anybody who doesn't value my time. I have no future. Yes. Curious men succeed. I listen for the sound of honor. Because if somebody doesn't trust me, I cannot help them. My words do not matter. I want to say this to every preacher. When you invest your time to advise and counsel someone and they do not follow your counsel, you're a fool to meet with them a second appointment. I listen for knowledge. I listen for curiosity. Many years ago, someone asked me, do you get tired of everybody wanting something from you? I replied, of course not. That's what I'm for. Mm -hmm. If I have something you need, you should ask me. I'll make the decision. But something is wrong if I don't inspire people to want something from me. Something's wrong if someone does not want something from me. Wow. Wow. It's what they want that the difference is. Nine, the difference in men is the question they're willing to ask. It's the unasked question that keep men poor. It's the unasked question that explains every failure. It's the unasked question that reveals the disinterested heart. Until you ask questions, your knowledge is accidental. Until you ask questions, others control your information. What questions should you be asking? In whose presence do I flourish? Whose words excite and inspire me? Who has the ability to inspire me? If you can inspire me, I have no business around you. Ten. The difference in men is the price they're willing to pay for uncommon mentorship. Mentorship is a shortcut to success. Mentorship is learning through the losses of someone else. Mentorship is learning through the pain of others. Mentorship is instant wisdom. Mentorship is learning without the season of waiting. Eleven, the difference in men is how they gather information. Some wait until they have a crisis to begin asking questions. Some wait for an invitation. Some wait for suggestions. Some wait until they have a major loss. Twelve, the difference in men is who they're willing to receive from. Thirteen, the difference in men is their reaction to someone who's struggling. The difference in men is how they react to the pain of others. Fourteen, the difference in men is who inspires them. Invest your favor only in someone who puts great value on your approval. Wow. Yes. Invest your favor only in someone who puts great value on your approval. Test everybody. The difference in men is whose favor matters the most to them. God gave you an imagination to picture a possibility, not a probability. 16, the difference in men is where they invest their imagination. 17, the difference in men is the mentor they pursue. Pursue. 18. The difference in men is their ability to stay inspired. The difference in men is who they want to inspire. 19. The difference in men is their recognition of their assignment. The difference in men is whose assignments they celebrate. 20. The difference in men is decided by the training of men. Who trains you for the future you dream about? Who trained the man you're wanting to date? 
What's the cost of the training? The difference in men is the voice they're willing to ignore. The purpose of training is safety. The purpose of training is safety. The difference in men is what they're willing to overcome. What are they willing to walk away from? Joseph walked away from Potiphar's wife. He became number two in the kingdom. David would not walk away from Bathsheba, and he lost favor with God. The difference in men is the voice they're willing to ignore. It's quite a book. Wow. Wow, wow. No book like it. It's book 568. Mm -hmm. Father, I thank you for the 20 women who will listen to the voice of wisdom, the voice of the Holy Spirit. I thank you for this irreplaceable teaching from your word. Thank yes. you for the Bible, the encyclopedia for life experiences. I thank you. I ask you for 20 women. I ask you for 20 women to meet the man of their dreams in 120 days based off of the obedience of the 120 in the upper room. I ask you in 120 days to give them the boldness to approach a man, to talk to a man that they find admirable, worth reaching for. Father, there's many women that don't realize some men are shy, timid. Some men are afraid of being spoken to, no. Turn down. That's why Ruth went to Boaz's house. Abigail went to David's camp. They weren't fools. They were brilliant women who knew to be accessible. Abraham sent his best man to find the wealth manager for Isaac's money. And Eliezer laid there on the ground with very, very thirsty camels. And he said, let the woman who serves me, wants to give me water, let her also want to take care of my camels. Let her be the one take care of all the bank accounts. Amen. Amen. Wow. There are 20 women that God is speaking to. I shared this today for two hours at 12 o'clock to 2. Conversation reveals. Conversation reveals. Of all the things God had said to call him, he could have said, call me the king of the universe. Call me the king of heaven. But he said, call me the word. Hmm. The word. By your word, you'll be justified or condemned. I want to pray for the 20. Leon Prado. Leon called within one hour. The mm. book number, 817-759-BOOK. Until Ernestine or Sheena or Joyce, my staff is waiting. They'll be there one more hour. And you tell them what you would like. I thank you, Father. I praise you, Father. Father, I ask you to give these 20 women of God a sense of greatness, a sense of character. And as they plant the seed of their choice, as they plant the seed of their choice, 
I ask you to initiate a shift, a powerful shift in their worlds. Yes. Amen. Wow. Amen. Hmm. I'll show you the information on the screen. Pastor Anna, what are your yes, strongest thoughts? Oh, Dr. Murdoch, this was so, so helpful. I am amazed on the path that you took women today in how to know who is a king. I love that when you said you will know who is a king when you feel like a queen. What a picture. I love your, uh, the way you read the book to us today, Dr. Murdoch, The Difference in Men. It's, uh, it just woke up so many pictures inside of me listening to you read your book. Very powerful. I agree with the partners that say that when you read your book, it's very, very powerful anointing that flows through you, Dr. Murdoch. There's 20 women. You plant the seed of your choice. You plant the seed of your choice and say prayer handkerchief when you call or when you write. You're sowing through Cash App. All you have to do is say, Prayer handkerchief. If you're sowing through PayPal, it's the seed of your choice. Notice I didn't establish a big amount of seed. There's 20 women. There's 20 women that may meet your man in 120 days according to the instructions of the Holy Spirit for your life. Wow. I've been single 42, 43 years. Big mistake, big mistake. It's a big mistake to stay single. Waiting like a puppy dog for the man to show up at your house of your dreams. When you meet the man of your dreams, he may not appear. He may become the man of your dreams through your proximity, your presence. A woman turns a private into a general. A woman turns the homeless into a king. A man is never enough without a woman. Even God knew that. Wow. No man is enough without a woman. There are 20 women that God is whispering to. And we will re-air this repeatedly throughout the night. May re-air it tomorrow. This is too important. I decree and declare my covenant with you that where two of us agree as touching anything, God will do it. I come into a covenant with Matthew 7, 7. Ask, seek, and knock. I come into a covenant with you. With Psalms 84, 11. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. I come into a covenant with you. With Numbers 23, 19. God is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of a man that he should repent. Screenshot this. And I say, good night. With Pastor Anna, we're going to close this. One hour has passed. I want the one hour to be re-aired. Father, I thank you for the 20 women that I ask you for. Let the next 60 minutes stir the hearts of those who are longing for a companion. In Jesus' name, amen. Pastor Anna, we won't yes, run sir. any videos. This is one hour of God's essence. I say yes. good night to you. Pastor Anna, you can tell the good night to all the partners. Yes, Dr. Murdoch, thank you so much. Yay, family. Thank you so much for joining us. Don't forget to register. The information is on the screen for Dr. Murdoch's birthday. And in two hours, this teaching will be available as a $5 download on the website, homepage website. We love you. Have a wonderful, wonderful rest of your night. 
And let me close with this declaration prayer. May the Lord bless thee and keep thee. May the Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace.